Recording by Matt Braymiller. The Story of the Gray House by E. and H. Heron. Mr. Flaxman Lowe declares that only on one occasion has he undertaken, unasked, the solving of a psychical mystery. To that case he always refers as the affair of the gray house. The house bears a different name in the annals of more than one scientific society, and much controversy has raged over the strange details of a story that seems to open up a new province of fantastic horror. Papers and treatises have been written about it in almost every European language, and many dismaying facts of a somewhat analogous nature have thus been brought to light. There was some hesitation at first about laying this matter, backed as it is by an explanation which, though terrible, is not altogether unsupported, before the public. But it has finally been decided to incorporate it in the present series. During the summer of 1893, Mr. Lowe happened to be staying in a lonely village on the coast of Devon. He was deeply immersed in some antiquarian work connected with the Old Norse calendars and therefore limited his acquaintance in the neighborhood to one individual, a Dr. Fremantle, who, besides being a medical man, was a botanist of some note. One afternoon, when driving together, Mr. Lowe and Dr. Fremantle passed through a valley which nestled cup-like in the higher ground a few miles inland. As they passed along a deep, steep lane with overhanging hedges, they caught a glimpse through a break in the leaves of a gray gable peeping out between the horizontal branches of a cedar. Flaxman Lowe pointed it out to his companion. "'That's young Montesson's house,' answered Fremantle. "'And it bears a very sinister reputation.' "'Nothing in your line, though,' with a smile." Indeed, no ghost would lend the same hideous associations to the place it now possesses as the result of a succession of mysterious murders that have occurred there. The grounds seem neglected. I don't remember to have seen such rank growth anywhere. Certainly not inside the British Isles, returned Fremantle. The estate is left to the care of itself, partly because Montesson won't live there, partly because it is impossible to find laborers to work near the house. Our warm, damp climate and this shelter position give rise to extraordinary luxuriance of growth. A stream runs along the bottom, and I expect all the low-lying land, where you see that belt of yellow African grass, is little better than a morass now. Fremantle drew up as they gained the top of the slope. From there they could overlook the tangle of vegetation dimmed by a rising mist which surrounded and almost hid the roof of the gray house. Yes said Fremantle, in answer to an observation of Mr. Lowe. Montesson's guardian, who lived here and looked after the property for him, turned the place into a subtropical garden. It used to be one of my chief pleasures to wander about here, but since my marriage my wife objects to my doing so on account of the tales she has heard. What is the danger? Death, replied Fremantle shortly. What form of death? Malaria? No disease at all, my dear fellow. The persons who die at the gray house are hanged by the neck until they are dead. Hanged? repeated Flaxman Lowe in surprise. Yes, hanged, not only strangled, but suspended, as the marks on the necks show. If there were any hint of a ghost in it, you might investigate. Montesson would be only too grateful if you could fathom the mystery. Tell me something more definite. I'll tell you what has happened in my own knowledge. Montesson's father died some fifteen years ago, and left him to the guardianship of a cousin named Lampert, who, as I told you, was a horticulturalist, and planted the place with a wonderful variety of foreign shrubs and flowers. Lampert had a bad name in the country, and his appearance was certainly against him, a squint-eyed, pig-faced fellow, who sidled along like a crab and could not look you in the face. He died first. Was he hanged, or did he hang himself? neither in this case. He dropped in a kind of fit, right up in front of the house, while he was engaged in planting some new acquisition. Had it not been for the evidence of the persons who were present at the time, I should have said his death resulted from some tremendous mental shock. But the gardener, and his relation, Mrs. Montesson, agreed in saying that he was not exerting himself unduly, and that he had had no disturbing news. He was a healthy man, and I could see no sufficient reason for his death. He was simply gardening, and had apparently pricked himself with a nail, 
for he had a spot of blood upon his forefinger after that all went well for a couple of years when during the summer holidays the trouble began montesson must have been about sixteen at the time and had a tutor with him his mother and sister a pretty girl rather older than himself were also here one morning the girl was found lying on the gravel under her window quite dead i was sent for and upon examination discovered the extraordinary fact that she had been hanged murder of course though we could find no trace of the murderer the girl had been taken from her bedroom and hanged then the rope was removed and she was thrown in a heap under her window the crime caused a tremendous sensation in the neighborhood and the police were busy for a long time but nothing came of their inquiries about a fortnight later platt the tutor sat up smoking at the open study window in the morning he was found lying out over the sill there could be no mistake as to how he met his death for in addition to the deep line round his throat his neck was broken as neatly as they could have done it at newgate as in the other case there was nothing to show how he came by his death no rope no trace of footsteps or any struggle to lead one to suspect the presence of another person or persons yet from the facts it could not have been suicide i see you had some suspicion of your own said flaxman low well yes i had but time has passed and i now think i must have been mistaken i must explain that the branches of the cedar you saw jut to within a few feet of the windows of the rooms occupied by miss montesson and platt respectively at the time of death i told you there were no traces of any one having approached the house it therefore struck me that some active person might have leaped from the cedar into the open windows and escaped in the same way for the windows open vertically and when both leaves are thrown back there is a large aperture but the murders were so purposeless and disconnected that they suggested irresponsible agency i recollected poe's story of the rue morgue where you remember the crimes were committed by an orangutan it seemed to me possible that lambert who was of a morose and strange temper might among other things have secretly imported an ape and turned it loose in the woods i had a thorough search made in the park and grounds but we found nothing and i have long ago abandoned the theory low thought silently over the story for some time then he asked for the dates of the three deaths freemantle answered categorically and it appeared that all had taken place about the same season of the year during the summer in fact upon this mr low made an offer to investigate the affair on psychical lines if montesson made no objection in answer to this message montesson took the next train down to devon and begged to be allowed to accompany mr low in his inquiries flaxman low quickly saw that montesson might prove a very useful companion he was a blond heavily built man and plainly possessed of a strong will and temper low put aside his books and went off at once with montesson to have a closer look at the gray house while the daylight lasted it is difficult to give any adequate impression of the teeming exuberance of wild and tangled growth through which they had to cut their way young lush sappy leafage overlay and half disguised the dank rottenness of the older vegetation beneath after wading more than breast high through the matted reeds below which the spreading stream was fast reducing the land to a swamp they emerged into a fairly open space that had once been the lawn round the house here brambles and lusty weeds now grew abundantly under the untended trees curious shrubs and plants flourished here and there as they came up a stoat sneaked away by a narrow footpath nettle-grown and caked with damp which led past blackened bushes around the house otherwise the place was deserted not a leaf seemed to move in the windless heat of the afternoon the squat gray face of the house was scarred across by a dark-leaved creeper hung with orchid-like blossoms a little to the left of which low noticed the cedar mentioned by dr freemantle low drew up at the weed-twisted sunken little gate that gave upon the lawns and spoke for the first time tell me about it and he nodded towards the house montesson repeated the story already told but added further details from here went on montesson you can see the exact spot where all these things took place the upper of these two windows surrounded by the creeper and under the shadow of the cedar belonged to my sister's room the lower is that of the study where platt died the gravel path below ran the whole length of the house 
but it is now overgrown. Has Fremantle told you of Lawrence? Low shook his head. I hate the very sight of the place, said Montesson hoarsely. The mystery and the horror of it all seem in my blood. I can't forget. My mother left on the day of Platt's death, and has never been here since. But when I came of age, I resolved to make another attempt to live here, meaning to sift the past if I got the chance of doing so. I had the grounds cleared about the house, and after leaving Oxford came down with a man of my own year called Lawrence. We spent the Easter vacation here, reading, and all went right enough. Meanwhile I had the house examined, thinking there might be a secret entrance or room, but nothing of the kind exists. This house is not haunted. Nothing has ever been seen or heard of a supernatural character. Nothing but the same awful repetition of blind murder. After a few seconds he resumed. During the following summer Lawrence came down with me again. One hot evening we were smoking as we walked up and down the gravel under the windows. It was bright moonlight, and I remembered the heavy scent of those red flowers. Montesson glanced round him strangely. I went in to fetch a cigar. It took me some minutes to find the box I wanted and to light the cigar. When I came out, Lawrence lay crumpled up as if he had fallen from a height, and he was dead. Round his neck was the same bluish line I had seen in the other two cases. You can understand what it was to leave the man not five minutes before in health and strength, and to come back and find him dead, hanged, to judge from appearances. But as usual, no trace of rope, or struggle, or murderer. After some further talk, Mr. Lowe proposed to go into the house. It had evidently been deserted in haste. In the room once occupied by Miss Montesson, her girlish treasures still lay about, dusty, moth-eaten, and discolored. Montesson paused on the threshold. "'Poor little fan. It's just as she left it,' he said hurriedly. The cedar outside threw a gloomy shade into the room, and the fantastic red blossoms drooped motionless in the stagnant air. "'Was the window open when your sister was found?' inquired Lowe, after he had examined the room. "'Yes, it was hot weather, early in August. This room has not been occupied since.' After Platt's affair, I have always avoided this side of the house, so that it was only by chance Lawrence and I came round to this part of the lawn to smoke. Then we may suppose that the danger, whatever it is, exists on this side of the house only? So it seems, replied Montesson. Your sister was last seen alive in this room, Platt in the room directly below, and your friend, what of him? Lawrence was lying on the gravel path just under the study window, all of them have died under the shadow of the cedar. Did Fremantle give you his idea? Poor Lawrence's death disposed of that theory. No big ape could live in England all those five years in the open, and in any case it must have been seen some time in the interval. I think so, replied Lowe abstractedly. Now, as to what we must do to try and get at the meaning of all this, do you feel equal, considering all that you have gone through in this house, do you feel equal to remaining here with me for a night or two? Montesson again glanced over his shoulder nervously. Yes, he said. I know my nerves are not as stiff and steady as they should be, but I'll stand by you, especially as you would not find another man about here willing to run the risk. You see, it is not a ghost or any fanciful trouble. It means a real danger. Think over it, Mr. Lowe, before you undertake so hazardous an attempt. Lowe looked into the blue eyes Montesson had fixed upon him. They were weary, anxious eyes, and, taken in combination with his compressed lips and square chin, told Lowe of the struggle this man constantly endured between his shaken nervous system and the strong will that mastered it. If you'll stand by me, I'll try to get to the bottom of it, said Lowe. I wonder if I should allow you to risk your life in this way, returned Montesson, passing his hand over his prematurely lined forehead. Why not? Besides, it is my own wish. As for risking our lives, it is for the good of mankind. I can't say I see it in that light, said Montesson in surprise. If we lose our lives, it will be in the effort to make another spot of earth clean and wholesome and safe for men to live on. Our duty to the public requires us to run a murderer to earth. Here we have a murderous power of some subtle kind. Is it not quite as much our duty to destroy it if we can, even at risk to ourselves? The result of this conversation was an arrangement to pass the night at Grey House. 
about ten o'clock they set out intending to follow the path they had more or less successfully cleared for themselves in the afternoon by flaxman lowe's advice montesson carried a long knife the night was unusually hot and still and lit only by a thin moon as they made their way along stumbling over matted weeds and roots and literally feeling for the path until they came to the little gate by the lawn there they stopped a moment to look at the house standing out among its strange sea of overgrowth the dim moon low on the horizon glinting palely upon the windows and over the deserted countryside as they waited a night-bird hooted and flapped its way across the open at any moment they might be at hand grips with the mysterious power of death which haunted the place the warm lush scented air and the sinister shadows seemed charged with some ominous influence as they drew near the house lowe perceived a sweet heavy odour what is it he asked it comes from those scarlet flowers it's unbearable lampert imported the thing replied montesson irritably which room will you spend the night in asked lowe as they gained the hall montesson hesitated have you ever heard the expression gray with fear he said laughing in the dark i'm that lowe did not like the laugh it was only one remove and that a very little one from hysteria we won't find out much unless we each remain alone and with open windows as they did said lowe montesson shook himself no i suppose not they were each alone when good night i'll call if anything happens and you must do the same for me for heaven's sake don't go to sleep and remember added lowe with your knife to cut at anything that touches you then he stood at the study door and listened to montesson's heavy steps as they passed up the stairs for he had elected to pass the night in his sister's room lowe heard him walk across the floor above and throw wide the window when Mr. Lowe turned into the study and tried to open the window there, he found it impossible to do so. The creeper outside had fastened upon the woodwork, binding the sashes together. There was but one thing left for him to do. He must go outside and stand where Lawrence had stood on the fatal night. He let himself out softly and went round to the south side of the house. There he paced up and down in the shadows for perhaps an hour. In the deceptive, iridescent moonlight, a pallid head seemed to wag at him from the gloom below the cedar, but, moving towards it, he grasped only the yellow bunched blossom of a giant ragwort. Then he stood still and looked up into the branches above, the gnarled black branches with their fringes of black sticky leaves. Fremantle's theory of the ape passing stealthily among them to spring upon his victims found a sudden horror of possibility in lowe's mind he imagined the girl awaking in the brute's cruel hands out upon the quiet brooding of the night broke a scream or rather a roar a harsh jagged pulsating roar that ceased as abruptly as it had begun without a moment's consideration mr lowe seized the branch nearest to him and swinging himself up into the tree he climbed with a frantic effort toward the window of montesson's room from which he was almost sure the sound had come being an unusually active and athletic man he leaped from the branch towards the open window and fell headlong in upon the floor as he did so something seemed to pass him something swift and sinuous that might have been a snake and disappear out the window remembering the candle on the toilet table he lit it when he regained his feet and looked about him. Montesson lay on the floor, crumpled up as he had himself described Lawrence's position. Lowe recalled this with misgiving as he hurried to his side. A dark smear like blood was on Montesson's cheek, but though unconscious, he was still alive. Lowe lifted him onto the bed and did what he could to rouse him, but without success. He lay rigid, breathing the slow, almost imperceptible respiration of deep stupor. Lowe was about to go to the window when the candle suddenly went out, and he was left in the increasing darkness, to all intents alone, to face an unknown, though tangible, assailant. Silence had again fallen upon the house, that is, the silence of night, and woodlands, and many-folded leafage, and the things that go by night. He stood by the window and listened. His senses were acute and throbbing. He felt as if he could hear for miles. The scent of the scarlet blossoms rose like deadening fumes into his brain, 
and he drew away from the window and feeling strangely spent threw himself upon a couch then he drew out the knife at his belt and strung himself up to watchfulness with an effort he knew that the attack he had to expect would likely come from the direction of the window he saw the faint swimming moonlight that fell through the leaves and tendrils of the creeper fade slowly away probably clouds were coming up over the sky for the steamy heat was even more oppressive the low window-sill was scarcely more than a foot above the floor and presently he fancied something was moving along the carpet among the entangling shadows of the leaves but the darkness was now intensified and he could not be sure montesson's breathing had become quieter it was the dead hour of the night hardly a sound was to be heard suddenly low felt a soft touch upon his knee his whole consciousness had been so absorbed in the act of listening that this unexpected appeal to another sense startled him here and there rapid soft and light the touches passed over his body it might have been some animal nosing about him in the dark then a smooth cold touch fell upon his cheek lo sprang up and slashed about him in the darkness with his knife in that instant the thing closed with him a flexuous snaky thing that flung its coils about his limbs and body in one swift spring like a curling whiplash flexman low was all but helpless in that winding grasp of what the tentacles of some strange creature or was it some great snake this sentient thing that was feeling for his throat there was not an instant to lose the knife was pressed against his body with a violent effort he drew it sharply edge outwards against the tightening coils a spurt of clammy fluid fell upon his hand and the thing loosed and fell away from him into the stifling gloom in the morning montesson came to himself in one of the lower rooms at the other side of the house freemantle was beside him what's the matter he asked ah i remember now there's low it has beaten us again freemantle it is hopeless i don't know what happened i was not asleep when i found myself seized lifted up drawn towards the window and strangled by living ropes look at low he went on harshly raising himself why man you're all over blood flaxman low glanced down at his hands looks like it he said it has beaten even you low went on monison there's something much more terrible and tangible than a ghost in this cursed house see here he pulled down his collar a faint bluish circle with suffused dots was drawn round his throat it is some deadly species of snake exclaimed freemantle low sat down astride a chair thoughtfully i am sorry to disagree with both of you but i am inclined to think it is not a snake and on the other hand i fancy it has a great deal to do with what we may roughly call a ghost the whole evidence points in only one direction you mustn't let your prejudice in favor of psychical problems run away with your reason said freemantle dryly has a ghost actual palpable power to go further has it blood montesson who had been looking at his neck in the glass turned quickly it's some horrible thing in nature something between a snake and an octopus what do you say to it low low looked up gravely in spite of freemantle's objections the steps from beginning to end are very clear freemantle and montesson exchanged a glance of incredulity my dear fellow much learning has warped your mind said freemantle with an embarrassed laugh first of all continued low we know where all the deaths have occurred to speak precisely they have all occurred in different places interposed freemantle true but within a strictly limited area the slight differences have been of material help to me in all cases they have occurred in the vicinity of one thing the cedar cried montesson with some excitement that was my first idea now i refer to the wall will you tell me the probable weight of lawrence and platt at the date of death platt was a small man perhaps under nine stone lawrence though much taller was thin and could not have weighed more than eleven as for poor little fan she was only a slip of a girl three people have been killed one has escaped in what way do you differ from the others montesson asked low if you mean i'm heavier i certainly am i scale something like fifteen but what has that to do with it 
everything the coils have evidently not sufficient compressive power to destroy life by strangulation simply there must be suspension as well you were simply too heavy for them to tackle coils of what of this low held up a tapering reddish-brown tendon or line which had red curved triangular teeth set on it at intervals the two other men stared at this object and then montesson burst out the creeper on the wall he said in a tone of disappointment it couldn't be besides has a plant blood let us go and look at it said low this creeper has never been cut because it withers away every winter to the ground and grows again in the spring look here he took out his knife and cut a leathery shoot a crimson stain spurted out on his cuff the only person as far as i can gather who cut this plant was mr lampert in nailing it to the wall he died of shock when he saw the red stain on his finger as he knew something of its deadly properties but though stupefying as your condition last night proved montesson they are not fatal even to stupefy they must get into the blood now the deaths have all occurred within reach of the tendrils of this plant and all have happened at the same season of the year that is to say at the time when it attains its full annual strength and growth another point in favor of montesson's escape was the dryness of the season the growth is not quite so good as usual this summer is it no the tendrils are thinner a good deal thinner and smaller just so therefore your weight saved you though you were stupefied by the punctures of the thorns i feared that and warned you to use your knife but the brain of the thing cried freemantle why man as a plant will and knowledge and malevolence not of itself as i believe answered low perhaps you will prefer to attribute much to the long arm of coincidence but the explanation i can offer is one that has long been held by occultists in other countries pythagoras and others have taught that the forms of incarnation change as the soul raises or debases itself during each spell of life connect this with the belief of the brahmins and i may add of various african tribes that an earthbound spirit at the moment of a premature or sudden death may pass into plants or trees of certain species by virtue of an inherent attraction possessed by these plants for such entities to go further it is said that these degraded souls have intervals during which they have power of voluntary action to do good or evil and such action has influence on their future incarnations what do you mean what do you intend us to believe montes had said and stopped it is hard to put it into words in these latter days of unbelief said low but the evidence goes to show that a man presumably not a good man dies a sudden death near this plant even inoculated with its sap freemantle knows this plant to be a malayan creeper belonging to a family that possesses strange powers and properties i may recall the old story of the upas tree and more lately still the murder tree discovered near colwe in east africa by herr boltz there are also other instances it is incredible said freemantle almost angrily i don't ask you to believe it said flaxman low quietly i only tell you such belief exists montesson can do something towards proving my theory let him have the plant destroyed and judge by results the tendril of the creeper severed by mr low in his struggle was presented by him to the authorities at kew mr montesson has acted upon mr flaxman low's suggestions the grey house is now occupied and safe and it is a strange fact that no plant not even the hardy ivy will live where the red blossomed creeper once grew end of the story of the gray house